So, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Abdullah Terkawi. I am from SEMA US. And uh, as some of you know, we started a community health education program last January. So, um, since we are all aware and worry about um, <clears throat> coronavirus, uh, we decided to change the lecture this month to coronavirus. And I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Uh, Mazen Khairallah, who is, mashallah, a triple board certified in infectious disease, critical care, and internal medicine. And he's a, an associate professor at University of North Dakota. And he has a lot of um, publications and very active in the academic. Uh, Dr. Mazen, uh, please. OK, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, what we will be talking about is this virus. Let me just see how I can advance it. OK, so the outline of this uh, talk is going to be number one, we will be talking about the virus, then the pandemic itself, the transmission dynamics, the illness, and then we'll end up with uh, prevention. And then you just want to start with a disclosure that uh, things are changing very rapidly. Some of the slides that I present today may not be uh, appropriate or uh, accurate in the next few days. So things are changing depending on how this uh, pandemic is unfolding. So starting with the virus first, uh, we uh, have seen several viruses so far. Uh, over the years that uh, causing uh, upper respiratory tract infection. They are from the coronavirus uh, family, uh, such as 229-EOC43, NL63, and HKU1. Those viruses circulate in the community <clears throat> year round, especially in the cold weather, and cause upper respiratory tract infections, such as common cold, and they rarely cause lower uh, respiratory tract infection. In the early 2003, we started seeing uh, a, a new virus uh, that is causing even a much more severe respiratory distress syndrome, lower respiratory tract infection. It's called uh, SARS. Uh, it is caused by coronavirus uh, 1, which is uh, different than the one we're dealing with right now. However, there are a lot of similarities in the genomes. <clears throat> that virus was transmitted to humans uh, through civet cats, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, outbreak uh, started in China and was contained uh, within the year. Several years ago, in 2012 exactly, another uh, virus jumped from uh, the camels to humans <clears throat> and caused even much more severe uh, uh, acute respiratory syndrome. Uh, I've been in Saudi Arabia during that time, actually. We took care of those patients. Uh, and it was associated with even much higher mortality rate, close to 35%. Uh, the uh, outbreak uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, is still uh, 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 still going on. However, the number of cases are much lower now. Of course, started in Saudi Arabia and uh, went out to different countries. The virus uh, that we're dealing with right now is another coronavirus that also jumped from animals to uh, humans. And we think this event occurred sometime in December at the wet market in China. And the uh, <clears throat> virus, we think it's, uh, it came through another intermediate uh, host coming from the uh, bat, which is the natural reservoir for the coronaviruses. As we see here, uh, the bat is the uh, uh, natural uh, reservoir for the coronaviruses. And this virus can jump to the human through another intermediary, intermediary host. In the case of SARS-2003, it was through the civet cat. In the case of uh, MERS, the Middle East uh, uh, Respiratory Syndrome, 
was through the camel and now we think it's through the pangolin but has not yet identified well. And this is to give you the comparison among uh, the uh, different uh, viruses. The uh, SARS in two, two, 2003, uh, no, total number of cases was around 8,096 cases, number of deaths, 774 started in China and uh, transmitted to 29 other countries. Mortality rate was 9.6 and uh, the uh, outbreak was contained by the end of the summer. In, uh, for, Mars, uh, for Mars 2012, total number of cases was 2,494, with number of deaths 858, started in Saudi Arabia and went to 27 other countries with a mortality rate of 34.4. And uh, the virus is still uh, transmitting in the uh, in the community, but it's not terribly efficient. Now, the numbers for uh, COVID-19 exceeding 175,000 now, with uh, more than 6,000 deaths started in China, more than 146 different countries so far, with a mortality rate of 3.7. So we need to understand how does the pandemic function? It goes through different stages. Start with the initiation phase. This is the epidemiological curve. And we see cases here and there <clears throat> before it reaches a critical point where the number of cases accelerates exponentially. So we'll see an increase, a, a rise in the cases in the community. And this is what we are living right now. Now, the number of cases will double based on what's the doubling time of the uh, virus or the pandemic. And the doubling time for the pandemic is around four to five days. However, if you notice, and we'll see that now in the next slides, if you not notice, the number of cases are actually doubling every two to three days in the States. And this is because of testing. Testing is actually scaled up and we are testing more people who were already infected in the community. Once we get to uh, <coughs> uh, testing at a large uh, scale, at that time we test everyone, we know what's the status of the uh, uh, pandemic in the, concept, uh, in, the, in the time being, and then we can actually see how it is doubling every four to five days. Then it reaches the peak, and after that starts to decline, and the pandemic will be ended uh, uh, when we have a limited cases left in the community. So this is what happened in China, and you can see the epidemiological curve almost completed. It went up to the acceleration uh, phase, and then the peak, and then the uh, declining phase. And now we can still see some cases uh, in China, but it is not at the same magnitude as it was in January and early February. In the uh, rest of the world, uh, we are in the acceleration phase so far. Uh, of course, this curve can actually be different uh, from one country to another, but this is putting everything together. What we see all over the world now is a, a, a dramatic rise in the number of cases throughout the world. And this is uh, only up till March 2nd. And you can see since March 2nd till now, we almost tripled that number. As of today at uh, noon time, we had total of 175,000 cases. Uh, this is from the uh, John Hopkins University. Probably this is the best site uh, if you want to uh, follow what's happening with the pandemic uh, on uh, hour by hour basis. Total deaths of 6,700 and total recovered is 7,700. Now I want to pay your attention that the mortality rate uh, or the case fatality rate is calculated by taking the number of deaths divided by the total confirmed cases. So that's why this number is very dynamic. You can see the mortality rate is changing from 2% to even up to 4%. It depends on what is, what is the denominator. Now, those are the confirmed cases. Those cases did not complete the course of the illness yet. So we don't know how many of those cases 
are going to end up with severe cases and then they end up dying. And this, there's a potential that this number may go up actually in terms of the ratio may go up above 3.7%. In fact, this is what happened with the SARS 2003. The, uh, when we had the outbreak, initially the mortality rate was around 4%. However, by the end of the outbreak, the mortality rate increased to around 10%. On the other hand, this uh, will be only the cases that reach to our attention. If we have other uh, cases in the community that they are not diagnosed yet, because of testing scale is not uh, scaled up yet, at that time, if we have another 175,000 cases in the community at the current time, mild to moderate cases, the mortality rate will actually go down to half. So just keep in mind that this case fatality rate is a dynamic number that will change day after day. It is changed also from country to another. The first case in the United States occurred on the 20th of January for someone who came from Wuhan, started, up, uh, started his symptoms with cough, and then followed up by fever, he had fatigue, and then he had some nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal discomfort. Later on throughout the course, he had some rhinorrhea. So the disease is mainly lower respiratory tract infection with a pneumonia because the virus gets uh, uh, attached to the ACE2 uh, receptors in the lungs, uh, and those are different than the ACE1 uh, uh, receptors. The same patient had evidence on the chest X-ray of interstitial infiltrates. In fact, most of the cases uh, ended up with, having, with some findings of uh, lower respiratory tract infection, uh, mainly ground glass uh, appearance on CT scans. They've done so many CT scans in China, but there is no need for doing CT scan. In fact, you don't want to uh, transmit the virus through different movements of these patients through uh, different departments in the hospital. So there is no need for doing CT scans for those uh, patients. In fact, the management would be similar to any other patient who has pneumonia complicated by uh, respiratory failure and ARDS. So let's follow the pandemic in the States, uh, and I'm going to go with the numbers with you so you can see the doubling time, what happened in the States since <clears throat> the 29th of February, where we had only 68 cases and only one death. And you can see after five days, went up to 221, so it's doubling every two days here, but this is again because of the scaling up the testing that we were not doing that much testing on those patients yet. Total deaths uh, at that time is 12. Uh, take a look from the fifth, two days after that, doubled again, 400 uh, patients throughout the states with a total deaths of 17. On the 10th, three days after, doubled again, almost 800. And on the 12th, uh, two days after that, uh, th 1,300 almost doubled. And uh, on the 14th, it was 2,175 with a total death of 47. Today is 4,000 cases in the state with total death of 69. So you can see that we are still in the acceleration phase and it's expected that this number will be in three to four days, maybe five days, it will be 8,000 cases in the states. So we're going to expect seeing more and more patients in the hospital with this disease. Now we need to assess the severity index for the pandemic. And this is actually defined based on the uh, WHO uh, definition that it, it goes from uh, through uh, uh, five categories. Uh, and this is really in relation to the mortality rate. If the mortality rate throughout the community is with this uh, pandemic is less than 0.1%, that is category one. The higher the mortality rate, the higher the category. And since we have a mortality rate above 2%, that means we are in category five. So this is the highest level of pandemic severity index of all in the, uh, pandemics. So that means if we have an attack rate of 30%, and in China, the attack rate was almost 0.5%, but it is because of the interventions that they've done in China. But if we have, let's just uh, be hypothetically, if we have 30% attack rate, with a population of, uh, of uh, uh, 300 million in the, in the States, that means that we're going to have 90 million uh, people infected. With a mortality rate of uh, 
of 3%, uh, that means we're going to have close to 3, 000, uh, 3 million people dead. But this is with the highest attack rate possible uh, that we may have. So how is, does this uh, disease, uh, 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 how, how is it compared to other, uh, other uh, uh, pandemics or outbreaks in terms of uh, uh, severity of illness and uh, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, average number infected uh, by each person transmissibility? So on the, on the uh, X uh, axis, we have transmissibility, how easy to transmit the virus to others. And on the uh, Y axis, we have the uh, severity of uh, illness, which is the mortality rate. And since we're talking about a mortality rate of around two to 3%, uh, so that means that we are in this area here. The lowest mortality rate reported was in China, 1.4% in the Chinese study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And now the, uh, the transmissibility, which is how easy we, we, we transmit the virus to others, it is expected that each one infected case can infect two to three people around it. So that's why you see it actually in, that, in this range. So this is where our uh, pandemic at this point, and in relation to MERS, you can see MERS was not actually transmitting very effectively in the community. And the reason why MERS was not uh, uh, effectively transmitting because it was a very severe disease. So patients were infected with and uh, coming to the hospital with a very bad pneumonia, respiratory failure, and ARDS. So the, when, when the patient is infected, it uh, declares itself it's, uh, e easily. And the patient comes to the hospital so we can actually contain the case in the hospital. So that's why it was not transmitted uh, uh, terribly efficiently in the, in the community, but the severity was very high, 35% severity. Now, if you uh, co compare to the swine flu, the swine flu was uh, in 2009. You can see transmissibility is very similar to COVID-19. However, the mortality rate associated with swine flu was much lower than this. Now we can actually uh, have the, uh, there's a, a, a newer pandemic severity assessment framework uh, by the CDC. And this uh, is also based on the severity, the clinical severity of the disease and the measure of transmissibility. And we measure transmissibility based on what we call the R0, which is how many people are infected uh, after uh, exposure to a single case. And uh, the higher the mortality rate, the higher the clinical severity, and the higher the transmissibility, the higher on the y-axis here. And uh, I'm going to go back to this, but I want to explain this in more details. For transmissibility, we have different indicators. Number one, we have the attack rate in the community, which we don't know yet. Number two, we have the symptomatic attack rate at the school, which we don't know yet. Of course, if we're closing the schools, we will not have a, a good estimate of what, it, what is the attack rate. Uh, <clears throat> also, we, we, we need to know the symptomatic attack rate at the workplace, and this is still unknown with this endemic, pandemic. Similarly, household secondary attack rate. What we know about it is the R0, which is the basic reproductive number, that what we know so far that it is more than two. We know that between two to three, each case of uh, influenza can infect around two, three people around it. And we don't know the peak percentage of outpatient uh, visits. Uh, and this is actually, this scale is, this uh, framework is specifically for influenza, and then we're, we're extrapolating this to our COVID-19. Now, in terms of severity, we have a case fatality ratio that is expected to be above 1% for sure. The case hospitalization ratio, it is also above 70%, 20% of those patients got as, uh, admitted to the hospital. And the death to hospitalization ratio, it is somewhat uh, between 16 to 18%, it may be higher. So what we know so far that it is actually severe disease. However, we don't know in terms of transmissibility, it may be similar to uh, the influenza, uh, swine influenza 2019, H1N1 2019, it may be higher or a little bit lower, we will see by the end of this uh, pandemic. So, it is important to now think about it this way. So if we have this uh, 
epidemiological curve for the uh, full out, uh, pandemic without any controlled uh, transmission. So that means we just let the virus uh, stay in the community. Let's not restrict people from movement uh, around and let's just see what will happen. What will happen is it will get to the peak and then we're going to see so many patients. This would be above the capacity of the healthcare system that we have. What we need is we need to accommodate those patients. This surge of patients need to be accommodated through ER visits. Uh, we need ICU beds, we need, we need ventilators and other uh, related uh, uh, things in, in terms of management of those cases. The capacity of the healthcare system will not be able to accommodate this need and it will be uh, uh, overwhelmed and the burden on the disease outcome is going to be dramatic too. Now we know that the disease is causing severe cases in 14% uh, uh, of them, 5% were critical cases and the mortality rate is two to 3%. This will be much higher if we let the, uh, the pandemic go this way. Instead, what we'll do is we'll try to flatten this uh, curve and uh, try to minimize the burden of this disease on the healthcare system. So what we do is number one, we'll try to delay the onset as much as possible. And in fact, we are in the acceleration phase. So what we'll try to do is try to decrease the peak and decrease the acceleration. So we don't see so many patients at the same time in the ER and the intensive care unit. And then we try to push that peak all the way below the capacity of our healthcare system. And in order to do this, we need to prolong the duration of the pandemic so we can flatten it and decrease that peak down. So by prolonging the, the, the pandemic, we can accommodate more patients within the capacity of the healthcare system. So those proactive measures uh, intended to slow the spread of disease and reduce the burden on healthcare system. We need to understand the transmission dynamics and we certainly know that uh, this virus is spread by respiratory droplets produced when uh, patient, infected patients coughs or sneezes, and uh, uh, that patient is in close contact with another person. So we can uh, contract the virus uh, by direct inoculation into the mucous membranes of the mouth, nose, or the eyes. We can also contract the virus by touching a contaminated surface with hands then touching the face without washing the hands. A patient can cough on that surface and then the virus can live a few hours to a few days on that surface. And then we can touch the surface and touch the eyes and get this, this virus transmitted. We can also get uh, the virus by direct uh, contact with infected people by uh, handshaking or hugging or kissing or anything similar to that. And uh, when the patient is contagious, uh, we know for sure that the patient is contagious after the respiratory secretions are actually uh, uh, apparent and uh, the patient is able to contract, uh, con to transmit this virus to others. So we know that transmissibility is at the highest when the patient is sick, maybe more symptoms also sneezing, coughing, that means the patient is, uh, is able to transmit the virus in more effective way. What we know for sure also that we have some cases that transmitted the virus in incubation time. The incubation time is between one to 14 days followed by the illness, which can be mild, moderate or severe for two to eight weeks. And then convalescence and, and we don't know if the patient is, if all the patients are actually uh, shedding the virus at the same degree. And we don't know if the patient after recovering from symptoms, would he still be contagious to the others or not. In patients in the hospital, we're not discharging those patients till we test the virus twice in 24 hours and making sure the PCR is negative. The virus has been isolated in respiratory secretions in the blood and also in the stool. So we probably, uh, we're talking about some fecal transmission, fecal route of transmission at the same time. So, what about pregnancy and lactation? Now, we don't know specifics about this, even though I just heard today that there was a case from, uh, from a pregnant mother, her, her, her uh, newborn is also infected. So they are looking into this case, but if we, if we look back at the coronavirus with the MERS and the SARS, there was no vertical transmission of the virus from the pregnant mothers to the fetus. 
And also there's no known transmission through lactation. We don't know if we have the phenomena of herpes spreaders because that was actually a phenomena that we've seen in MERS, those patients who are very sick, they are super spreaders of the virus at the same time. This is a proof that the virus can be transmitted during the incubation uh, period. This is a, a business wo businesswoman who came to Germany, met with two other uh, people, both got uh, infected with the virus. However, there are three other, uh, two other people who did not meet this woman, did not, did not attend the meeting, but they, they, contact, they were in close contact with the people who were infected from her. And you can see they were in close contact, these two patients, before, before the symptoms started. So the contact occurred before symptoms appeared on those patients, patient number one and patient number two. This is just published a few days ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. I want to elaborate more on the uh, uh, route of transmission, which is mainly droplet. And what we mean by droplet is, is those droplets that are actually uh, generated from the cough and the uh, sneeze. And it, those droplets usually with multiple uh, particles uh, uh, containing uh, epithelial cells uh, and uh, viruses uh, in addition to water. It depends on the size of the droplet. If it is more than 100 micron, it would drop within one or two feet uh, after uh, uh, sneezing or coughing. If it is more than uh, uh, 10 micron, it will actually travel a little bit further to probably around three feet. That's why we say you need to keep a distance of at least three feet better if it is six feet. However, there's a phenomena of infectious droplet nuclei where the water will evaporate and will be left with the nuclei only. This will be less than 10 micron in size and will be airborne. That's why there's a possibility of transmission through the airborne. But this is more specific actually in the hospital where we have some procedures that can generate, generate aerosol, uh, such as bronchoscopy, intubation, um, mechanical ventilation, especially with the high frequency ventilation with active expiration, non-invasive uh, non mechanical ventilation is risky. Once you intubate those patients, the circuit is closed, they get less riskier unless we have them on high frequency ventilation or you open the circuit for those patients. Also tracheostomy is uh, the, uh, risky for transmission. High flow nasal cannula is also associated with aerosol production. So it is advised to minimize the utilization of this. And at the same time, you need to have all the protective measures appropriate for airborne transmission, meaning the patient needs to be in a negative pressure room, wearing a N95 mask, goggles, and in addition to the contact isolation. <clears throat> this is the R0, which is the uh, basic reproductive number. How many patients will be infected after exposure to a single case? In the case of influenza, it is between one to four and a half, depending on the season of the year. Uh, and, and in case of uh, measles, it is the highest actually between 12 to 18. In the case of COVID-19, as we said, it is between two and three. The virus can be, uh, uh, can live on the, on the surfaces uh, for a few hours to a few days, depending on the type of the surface and the temperature. It is uh, uh, postulated that uh, higher temperature will probably uh, kill the virus uh, faster. So the virus may not, not live as, as, as long as it is in a colder temperature. Viruses can be easily inactivated by hydrogen peroxide, ethanol, and sodium hypochlorite. What is the clinical syndrome? So as we said, the incubation time is one to, four, uh, uh, one to 14 days, but the median incubation time is around five days. So most of the patients exhibited symptoms around five days. And those symptoms were cough, fever, and myalgia in addition to shortness of breath. As we said, CT scan findings was, uh, were seen in almost 86% of the cases. The diagnosis was made by BTR. We obtained nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs at the same time. In addition, 
to the lower respiratory uh, tracts uh, uh, specimens such as sputum or bronchoalveolar lavage. In 81% of the cases, the disease was mild to moderate. In 14% of the cases, was severe, and 5% were admitted to the intensive care unit. More severe disease uh, was seen in, in advanced age and chronic comorbidities, morbidities, and we will see that uh, later. And the mortality rate was around 3.7, 3.5 so far. So the symptoms in 87, 88% of the cases, uh, they exhibited fever. However, in the Chinese study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine, almost 54% uh, of the cases did not have fever and admission. However, almost 88% developed fever during the course of the disease. So taking temperature as a screening may not be very sensitive. Dry cough is uh, seen in 68%. Fatigue in 38%, sputum production was 33%, and shortness of breath in about 19%. The mortality was the highest uh, if uh, the patient is uh, 80 years or above, 15%. 17 to 79 was 8%, 60 to 69 was 8.6, and above 50 is 1.3. That's why we are recommending that those patients who have, or those people who have, who are older than 65, be isolated and taking extra cautions not to be contacted by a, an infected case. At the same time, the mortality rate was higher in those patients who have chronic comorbidities, uh, such as cardiovascular disease, congestive heart failure, and uh, coronary artery disease in 10.5%, diabetes in 7%, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, cancer in around 6% in each one of this. In addition, now we know, we know also obesity is associated with higher mortality. If you don't have any of the other comorbidities, the mortality rate is less than 1%. Those are the uh, patient individuals at high risk of uh, bad outcome, uh, older patients, uh, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, chronic lung diseases, weakened immune systems such as immunosuppressed patients uh, or with steroids or with uh, medica other medications, cancerous patients, and obesity, as we mentioned. What is the prevention, protection, and treatment? <clears throat> so what we need to do is the following. We need to wash our hands with soaps and water. Warm water uh, is advised, and you need to wash, wash the hands for 20 seconds at least. When you wash the hands, you need to make sure that you cover all uh, aspects of the uh, of the hands, dorsum and palms of the hands. Also, you need to make sure that you clean in between the fingers and also underneath the nails. It's it's advice also to trim the nails. We uh, recommend soap and water as number one. If it is uh, not accessible at that time, we it's okay to use hand sanitizer, but at least the alcohol level should be 60 to 95 percent but you will be lucky if, if you find some hand sanitizers now cover the coughs and sneeze at all time with uh, tissue or uh, or uh, napkins uh, and all the time avoid touching faces with unwashed wash and washed uh, hands because that's way if you touch any surface that's contaminated you get it into the eye nose or or mouth and you contract the disease those surfaces who are uh, those surfaces which are often touched needs to be disinfected regularly and uh, multiple times per day, and you need to avoid contacts and gatherings. And we elaborate a little bit more about that. What we mean by avoiding gathering, we mean is social distancing. We need to stay away. We need to be isolating ourselves from any other activities that is not needed. Those activities could be going to theater, going to cinemas, going to the mosque or the church, going to meetings, going on public uh, transportation, the subway or the uh, buses, going to restaurants and going to schools. We can change to virtual uh, ed uh, education. And this is what happened in many cities now, including the uh, Chicago area, all the schools almost uh, uh, closed and uh, changed to virtual learning. Similarly, at uh, the mosque, most of the mosques in the United States now are not 
are not actually serving Friday prayers. And now they start also suspending the five uh, daily prayers too. This is very important concept. We need to understand it because without social distancing, uh, we're going to transmit the virus faster and faster. So we overwhelm the healthcare uh, system with its capacity. The high touch surfaces that need to be cleaned so often would be the light switches, the uh, common phones that we use uh, in, the, in the house, the faucets, uh, uh, door handles, uh, keyboards, mouses, uh, toilets, uh, and uh, uh, other surfaces, tables, end tables, and such. Those are only examples. You can actually look at your house and see what uh, are the high touch surfaces uh, in your house and make sure that those are disinfected regularly and frequently during the day. If you go outside, there are also common touch surfaces such as the elevator buttons, the hand doors, and everything. The door hand. Symptoms of COVID-19 for public, fever, cough, shortness of breath. Symptoms may take one to 14 days to appear after exposure. What should I do if I get the sick? You, sh you should stay home. You should not seek medical advice unless it is needed because you will have some cough, fever, just stay home. You, know, you don't need to be tested for this unless you came from uh, outside or the symptoms are severe. You came from an endemic area. Separate yourself from others and no sharing uh, uh, with utensils and other uh, objects and materials in the house. You need to stay in the same room. If possible, use uh, your own bathroom also. You need to see a doctor for if symptoms worsened, call the office first. Do not go to the office and sit in the office and transmitting the virus to the other people who are in the waiting, uh, waiting room. If you leave the, the, the house for any reason, you need to wear a mask and it is advised also that you wear a mask when you are inside the house in front of your other family members. Of course, you need to continue cleaning the high touch areas and you need to uh, make sure that you wash hands with, uh, frequently with soap and water for 20 seconds too. There are, there's no vaccine yet, they're working on it, and there's no specific treatments except in clinical trials and off-label use. And in France, they advise, the, there's, there's a remark, there is a notice that uh, the use of NSAID is associated with a prolonged disease, uh, uh, and it is advised to avoid uh, NSAIDs such as ibuprofen. This is how you need to make sure that you wash the hands thoroughly, including all uh, surfaces of the hands. And in the hospital, you need to make sure that you have airborne precautions before you get into the room of the patient, especially if the patient is on non-invasive mechanical ventilation, on high, uh, frequent, high, high uh, flow nasal cannula, or the patient, uh, or you are performing a tracheostomy intubation for that patient, this patient should be in airborne precautions. We uh, put all the patients in uh, negative pressure rooms unless the uh, uh, capacity is exhausted. At that time, we start putting the patients in the regular pressure rooms in the hospital. In addition to the airborne precautions, you need to make sure that you have contact precautions. On top of that, you need to wear uh, eye protection uh, with the uh, goggles. In terms of treatment, uh, there's nothing specific except for in supportive care, you need to make sure that you don't overwhelm those patients with fluid. You need to use conserva conservative fluid strategy for those patients unless the patient is hemodynamically unstable. Everything else is similar to the management of, uh, of any other patient with uh, acute respiratory failure and pneumonia, except uh, if the patient deteriorates, we like to intubate those patients uh, quicker than what we do for other patients because non-invasive mechanical ventilation is risky in terms of transmission, and most patients who had non-invasive mechanical ventilation ended up intubated, actually. 94% of those patients in the other MERS uh, coronavirus uh, uh, outbreak. <clears throat> uh, we uh, aim to prevent and manage complications and questions about uh, specific treatment. There are reports about lobinavir, ritonavir being used in MERS coronavirus and it is effective uh, in, in some of uh, limited uh, studies. And there are now uh, some studies looking at this agent in the uh, COVID-19. 
Toli, uh, tocilizumab uh, is another agent that is used only if you have the cytokine uh, uh, syndrome, the cytokine release syndrome. Uh, when the inflammation is very severe, ferritin is high, sedimentation is, is high at that time. This agent is uh, anti-interleukin-6 and can, uh, uh, can uh, uh, decrease the inflammatory response in those patients. Chloroquine is another agent that uh, has some activity against this virus, and you can use it off-label if your hospital allows that. Remdesivir is another agent. Uh, it's a nucleotide analog, and uh, there's an ongoing trial looking at this agent, uh, one in China and one in the States here started in Nebraska. So I would like to conclude by emphasizing about avoiding gathering and uh, social distancing in, in addition to washing hands frequently, avoiding close contact with others and not touching the face and uh, uh, with and wash hands. So uh, if uh, you develop fever, cough and shortness of breath, you need to inform your primary care provider. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Khairallah. Uh, Mashallah, very impressive. You covered uh, everything, and even the questions that I prepared for you, you already covered them. Um, I would uh, see if the audience have any questions. Anyone has any question? Assalamu alaikum. I have one question. Okay. Go ahead. Um, uh, I haven't seen any slide, or maybe I missed it, about uh, the number of testing happening uh, per day by the U.S. or and how do you see uh, it increasing? Well, the testing has been limited, actually, and we don't know how many uh, tests have been performed. This is not uh, released anymore to the public or to the physicians. However, it has been promised that by uh, this week, we're going to see a scale up in testing so we can actually order this test uh, more often and the physician can decide when to, when to obtain the test. At this point, you need to call your local uh, health uh, department office and uh, you get screened most of, the, most, of the, most of the time based on the county that you're in and uh, your patient will be screened, and then they will approve or disapprove the test for you. However, I think we're going to see changes by the end of this week where we can freely order this test and perform it on our patients who are severely ill. Again, we don't need to, to do the test on patients who have mild symptoms, only those patients who come to the hospital and we need to confirm those cases. So even on average, uh, uh, on average, uh, in South Korea, in a daily basis, they do 15,000 tests. And in, in US, what is the current rate? As I said, we don't know because the number is not released to the public. Okay, got it. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, just uh, one regarding the severity compared to other, uh, you know, pandemics, if you will. If, if you can look at that graph again, I mean, is it is it the case that uh, basically you don't have all the numbers compared to uh, N1H1 and, and other pandemics? Uh, that's why we still see, you know, at least for on, on the WHO um, measure, we still see COVID like not necessarily on on the you know the same level of magnitude on these curves or just I was a little surprised about you know the metrics. I mean, said, didn't sound that it's at the same level of magnitude uh, uh, as other pandemics, but uh, definitely this is not the same responses that we see from the governors and officials um, across the globe as other pandemics. So what's What's behind that? Is it we don't have the, all the numbers? Well, it's dynamic. We don't know yet what will happen. As I said, in terms of the mortality rate uh, with, the, uh, with the SARS 2003, it started out around like 3 to 4%, ended up at 10%. So it was much, 
much more severe. Now, any mortality rate above two uh, percent is a bad, uh, bad pandemic. This is very high because think about it: if you have a population of one million and the attack rate is around uh, fifty percent, that means uh, if we have a population above about one hundred million, attack rate is fifty percent. So you have fifty million infected with the virus. A mortality rate of two percent. You can do the math, see how many patients will be dead. It is tremendous. So 2% and above is high if the attack rate goes higher and higher. And this is the emphasis why we are talking about this uh, pandemic as a big thing. It is something serious that people need to understand that we need to stay home. If there is no reason to get outside the house, there is, there is no need for doing that. We need to stay home, especially if you are one of those people who have high risk elderly patients and other comorbidities. Now, this is actually in comparison to the others. Again, look at where the MERS transmissibility was not that great. However, it was very deadly. We ended up with the MERS having only 8,000 patients. However, 35% of those patients died. Still low number, relatively speaking. Compared to, we're still in the start of the pandemic, with the COVID-19, we already have seven, almost 7,000 patients dead and more than 175,000 patients infected. So what will happen when we get to a million infected? It's going to be a much higher number of deaths in the uh, pandemic. So that's, this is the importance why uh, we are emphasizing much about the uh, limiting the transmission of this virus. Got it. And the attack rate of 25%, this is the Chinese uh, announced numbers, if I recall correctly, not, not the global, or is it or, no, or no, the, the global attack, attack rate? rate is, is... There's no known yet attack rate because we the pandemic did not finish. But so far, if you take a look on, on Wuhan alone, the population of Wuhan is 12 million people. It only infected 60,000 of them, which is close to 0.5%. But this is with the extreme interventions that been taking place in the city. And you've seen how this, the whole city was locked down in order to prevent the transmission of the virus. Okay, this is happening now in Italy, and I think it's going to happen in other countries where the magnitude of the pandemic is escalating to a higher level. And now you can see how it's actually what the interventions occurred in, in France, and in, in Saudi Arabia, they are doing uh, drastic interventions too, trying to limit the uh, transmission of the virus. Closing the border is something that is advised at that uh, at this point. And this is what uh, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia is doing, uh, France, uh, other European countries are doing the same thing. In addition to the social distancing within the uh, community. Dr. Khairallah, um what will be um, a trigger like at the personal level like you know we are all obsessed about symptoms like every now and then you think yes i'm coughing yes i have a sore throat what will be your recommendation like what triggers okay. for us should so make it us all depends on your understanding of the uh, uh, the uh, probabilities now uh, if we need to apply the same fear factor, uh, two of my kids now have coronavirus because they, they, uh, they have sore throat, they're coughing, and uh, some mild fever. However, uh, what's the likelihood that he's going to contract another virus other than corona? It is much higher still, given all this what's happening with the COVID-19 so far, but the likelihood the, to get a virus other than uh, coronavirus is still higher. Unless we get to a rate, an attack rate that is very high in the community, transmissibility is very high at that time, the probability of contracting coronavirus would be at the same or even higher level. So two days ago, uh, uh, after I gave a lecture at the mosque, uh, a, a woman came to me with a temperature of one or two and she said that she's fat has fatigue and sore throat so and this just happened two hours ago 
So I, I told her, well, this is strep throat. Well, she's afraid of coronavirus. In fact, we sent her, to, I don't have a clinic in Chicago. So uh, she went to one of the urgent clinics and the test was positive for strep throat. So the likelihood that you're going to have the normal viruses that circulates around this year of the uh, around this time of the year is still higher than the likelihood that you're going to get coronavirus. That's number one. However, the coronavirus can cause mainly lower respiratory tract infection. So what do I think that this is actually is uh, worrisome? Fever, cough. If you start having shortness of breath. This is not good. This is, it looks like coronavirus. Do I need to see a physician? If your if symptoms are mild to moderate, the best thing is to stay home. If your symptoms worsened at that time, call the office and, um, and get uh, to be seen. At that time, they will do the test and confirm the corona. You isolate yourself either way, whether you have a, a, a rhinovirus, adenovirus, uh, uh, influenza, or uh, coronavirus, you need to isolate yourself when you get sick. So the treatment, supportive treatment and isolation is not different from any other virus. So that's why we say the best thing is that pers person who is likely to have coronavirus should not leave house and start infecting others in the community. Thank you for this. Um, in the same context, you're speaking about your kids. So my daughter, she also had a, a runny nose and cough. So we took her to the pediatrician and she did uh, the PCR for the common viruses like you know the rhinovirus and came out negative. So would that make you think that, oh, if this common virus came out negative, should I think about coronavirus or that's more like a reassuring thing? Well, again, uh, it's, uh, it, it all depends on the severity. I would not do any testing on, uh, it's actually, it's so it, it, they've done the test is just because of the fear. I don't do uh, a, a, re a regular PCR on it unless I'm dealing with a lower respiratory tract uh, symptoms. Now the approach in the hospital, and I don't know which county you're in, but uh, in Chicago here, the approach is the following. Mild to moderate disease, they don't test anybody. L pneumonia with, with, with uh, hospitalization, you need to rule out other in, uh, viruses first. So you need to send for influenza, get the test first. If it is negative, send the PCR for the respiratory panels. If all negative, at that time, they test for coronavirus for you. I think this is wrong. I think they should test for everything at the same time. But this is also, it was related to the uh, limitation in, in testing due to availability. I think it's going to change by the end of the week for any uh, pneumonia uh, that is hospitalized, we will run the test, including the coronavirus. So for someone who has uh, runny nose, uh, sneezing, uh, low grade temperature, in a child also, more likely that this is one of the other viruses. Unfortunately, the PCR did not pick it up. It may be another virus or something like that. Or, of course, you need in a, in a patient who has sore throat, fever, you need to rule out streptococcus pharyngitis. This is the primary uh, approach that you need to approach, especially with, with kids, because the number, you know, I thought I would be asked this question, the number of children affected with this pandemic is relatively low. And the severity associated with this for those who are infected is also low. I think the number of this was very, very uh, minimal in the Chinese uh, population who were infected with this virus. So you're adding another factor that even in kids, the probability of having the virus is lower. Now, people speculate that maybe they're not showing the symptoms, they are carrying the, 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 uh, the uh, virus, and maybe they are playing a role in transmitting the virus in the community. So that's why we need to apply the same rules for our kids. To, uh, to have them uh, uh, obey to the uh, social distancing. And that's why we're closing the, uh, the schools and keeping them home. However, they're not showing the symptoms as much as the uh, adult population uh, uh, is. Thank you very much. Um, I think if no one else has questions, uh, we would like uh, really to thank you for this uh, prosperous information and very rich lecture. Um, thank you very much.
جزاك الله خير واياكم يعطيك العافيه عرفت جي هاف ا كويشن الله يجزيك الخير دكتور مازن اهلا وسهلا وي ويل ستوب ريكوردينغ ذيم انا اي هاف سم كويشنز باي ذا واي يو كان جو تو جو هيد Uh, yes, is there any news about uh, vaccines? And uh, do you think this uh, 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 this uh, disease will be uh, the epidemic uh, annually, uh, annual epidemic disease? Uh, and what about uh, uh, the prime minister uh, plan in uh, UK? Uh, do you think uh, it will be uh, good for uh, UK population or uh, not good? Okay, so let me pull up uh, another uh, presentation so I can explain what's happening in England. Uh, okay, so the, uh, the way they are approaching this in England is based on the, what we call the herd immunity. So what does that mean? They need to, of course, this is related to, again, the R0, which is in the case here is two to three, and it's related to, let's create enough number of immunized patients in the community. So that means they need to, co to transmit the disease to as high number as possible in the community but they want to protect the, those patients who are at higher risk. So they are isolating elderly patients, isolating the patients with the chronic uh, diseases mentioned in uh, my presentation, and letting the younger population, the kids, transmit the virus in the community. What will happen later is everybody will be immune. When we get two sick ones in the community, the likelihood, it's all a uh, game of numbers, the likelihood that it will infect the patients who are not immunized is very low. So this way, they will have what we call the herd uh, immunity. But I think this is actually, just let me show you this example. This is what they're doing. This is immunization rate. This is the, the principle of the vaccines. They are blind, the principle of the vaccine can get people immunized either by the vaccine or Dr. Mazin, Dr. Yes. Mazin, sorry, we are not seeing uh, what you are talking about. Uh, I don't know if you changed the screen or not. Wow, yeah. You should have told me. And they stopped uh, sharing. So I hope, let me just go back. So this is, this is the, what we call herd immunity, where we have we need to create immunity within the population. How do you create immunity? You either do vaccination, which is not available yet. I think your question was about vaccines. The President uh, Trump announced that uh, they were able to create the vaccine, but it needs to be tested. And it's easy to create the vaccine. Uh, it's, it's not difficult because the uh, genome has been sequenced uh, uh, already. So we can create the vaccine. However, we need to test it and that will take time. Maybe we'll see it within six months, but it's expected to be within 12 uh, months. So we're going to have a year around before we see vaccination. So what England is doing is actually they want to create immunity with the disease itself. How do they do that? They transmit the disease. So let's get this disease transmitted in the community. However, who's at highest risk of death with this disease? Those elderly patients, and the patients with co uh, comorbidities. So they want to isolate those patients. They want to socially distance those patients while they are transmitting the disease among others who are younger, who can tolerate the, uh, the outcome of this disease so they can be immune. Once they are immune, even, and take a look here, even though we still have people who are not immunized. I'm sorry, we're still not seeing your screen. I resumed it. It's not. No, we can't see. Are you seeing it now? Yes, uh, now we no. are seeing it. I, I think you, you. Yes, now we are seeing it. 
Okay, good. So, so take a look here. So those are the yellow ones are immunized now, but they are immunized by disease. Even though we still have the blue one are the susceptible ones, even though we still have them in the community, when these two cases come and start contacting others, it is by chance there will be less to, co con uh, to transmit this disease to the others. And what you see here is only one other person got infected, the three were protected. So this is what we call herd immunity. If we do not have this herd immunity, two cases in the community will almost transmit to everyone. So what happens here, those ones who are immune give protection to the others. And take a look on here. So you can see this, this is the vaccination rate. If it is 10%, 30%, 50%, 28%, one case goes to the community, the red, is actually infected ones. It will infect almost everyone who is not immune till we reach a certain level of immunity in the community. In this case here, it was 83%. And then the chance, even though a case is coming into the community, however, the chance to infect those people who are not immunized is much less. So this is the principle that they are actually taken. However, you need to understand the following you need to immunize. This is actually the, 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 the relationship between what we call critical control threshold, which is the level at, at which the immunization will achieve and will provide protection in the community is related to the reproduction ratio, which is the R0. In our case here, the COVID-19 R0 is 2.5. That means we need to immunize 60% of the population. What does that mean? It means that we need to infect 60% of the population. 60% of the United States population is 180 million people. Mortality rate, even in the younger population was around 0. 0.5 to 1%. So people are going to die for others to live. So this is the concept that they are doing. And the other thing is that you need to have a healthcare system that can accommodate those sick ones. You're going to infect 60% of the population in order to get the herd immunity. You're going to see cases in the hospital. The United States healthcare system capacity cannot accommodate the, such an attack rate. So we're talking about an attack rate of 60%. They want to control it. I think if you saw the plan, it goes with A, B, and C groups. So they're going to isolate the A group at home. Those are the riskier ones. And B group is going to see those and care for those riskier ones at home. And the C group is going to circulate in the community. And then they're going to change between C and B. So everybody will get uh, the, uh, the immunity eventually. It is an approach that can be tried. I think it is very risky. And for sure, people are going to die at the end of this for others to live. So I'm sorry it was a long uh, answer to this question, but I thought it is a great question so we can understand this. I think this the is, other question about the vaccine and they already answered it. This is a very impressive explanation. So what, what we can yeah. conclude here that what the UK is trying is basically cannot be tried in the US for the capacity of the health system. Which, which city do you work with in? Uh, I'm in Stanford. Okay, so if you, if you work in one of those uh, uh, inner uh, uh, hospital, uh, inner city hospital in Chicago, you know, and you, have, and you have a case in the intensive care unit that you want to transfer to another institution, in, in the time outside the pandemic, you may wait one or two days before a critical care uh, bed is open in the city of Chicago. Yeah, that's very true. Right. So think about it, what will happen if we are going to have hundreds or thousands of patients in the intensive care unit. You know, let me show you something else. I think this is a very good audience. And let me just see if I can show this. This will, will explain it very well. You see the screen still? Uh, not yet. Okay. 
Tell me when you start seeing it. Not yet. This is strange because I'm not changing anything. I just saw, uh, you know what? Let me new share. Oh, I see why. Okay, so let me just, uh, it was the application. Now you should see it, right? Yes, yes, we are seeing okay. it now. Now, this is a calculator that I actually programmed. For people who do not know, I also program in five different computer languages, but this is a very simple one, an Excel uh, uh, calculator. Okay, so what we did in this calculator is this is specific to our hospital. And if somebody wants to, uh, uh, to get it, uh, I'll send it to you. Send me your email, I will send. I have a generic one that is not applicable. Let me just pull out the generic one, actually. Uh, so this is a generic one. It's easier to understand because that one has specifics to our uh, hospital at uh, University of North Dakota. So what we have here, our available resources, we have our normal operation, okay, and we have the pandemic assumptions. And actually, I give a, a roughly uh, ICU bed occupancy rate of 50%. And I said ventilator use rate is 50%. And I assume that the hospital is serving a population of 500,000 people. And look at the symptomatic attack rate. I gave only 1%. Out of 500 people, look at what happens. Number of infected patients with COVID-19 is 5,000. Severe cases, 950. Critical cases, 250. Ventilated cases, 125. This is for a pandemic that lasts 16 weeks and peaks for duration of four weeks. However, let's just see if we put the population of the United States. 300 million people. One, two, three, four, five, six. And let's see what happens. This is only with 1% attack rate. 1%, not 60%. Look at how many infected. Three million. Look how many severe cases. 570,000 cases. How many critical care uh, cases? 150,000 cases. Do you think that we can accommodate this in our healthcare system? No way. This is only with attack rate of 1%. If we do 60%, and this is what we need, we're talking about huge numbers beyond the capacity of any healthcare system. Of course, we need to do some prolongation of the pandemic, so we need to change the spread to over probably 18 months. So we'll do 18 months, uh, I'm sorry, 18 months, how many weeks is that? Let's just calculate it. 18 months divided by four. Seventy-two and weeks. So we'll do it seventy-two weeks, and with this, still we're going to have over 18 months, we're going to have one, two, three four, five, six, nine million cases in the ICU over 18 months. This is the, uh, the uh, herd immunity approach. And that's why I don't think anybody has considered it, considered it in, the, in the States. That's uh, really good information. Uh, how is health insurance company responding to this, doctor? If I, I may ask that. Well, I'm not sure about specifics. I know that the test is free to everyone. And I, I, I did not see, I was told that the federal government is going to cover the expenses of every single case that contracts COVID-19, whether they have insurance or not. But I have not seen that myself. This is only, I heard it through the news. And also, uh, I know that for sure that there is a, uh, the uh, state of emergency that was, that was declared. And I know the purpose is to get uh, the $50 billion uh, uh, for this uh, epidemic or pandemic. 
and I think they will they will use that fund to cover those 